Okay. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, so I just want to quickly introduce wh uh, wh what's going on today. Um, this is the first event in our Grads at NERSC uh, series. Um, so April is, uh, I think, Grad Student Appreciation Month, and um, almost 44% of our <laughs> first users are um, graduate and postdoc users. Um, just a reminder, if you're uh, just listening, please feel free to mute yourself. Um, so we really appreciate all the amazing work that's done by all of our graduate student and postdoc users. And so we wanna have some events that ideally are going to help you uh, do your work and your science even better here at NERSC. So the first event we have today is uh, how to do deep learning with Jupyter Notebooks and beyond. Um, we have some NERSC staff here who are gonna talk about the process of getting started with machine learning and deep learning in a Jupyter Notebook, and then how to progress from a notebook um, on to using our batch scheduler to, to run larger parallel training. Um, I've listed a couple learning outcomes here. We're hoping this is what you get out of today's session, but I'm really looking for your feedback. So at the very end, I would encourage you all to um, let us know how we did, let us know how this event was, and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully improve it in, in the future. So I wanna go ahead and pass it on to Steve and Shashank. They are our NERSC uh, ML presenters for today and uh, take it away. Thank you so much. Cool, thanks Lippy. Uh, and thanks everybody for coming. See, we have about 50 participants. That's pretty good. Machine learning always brings, uh, brings up the crowds. Um, yeah, so as Lippy said, we're gonna, um, talk to you a bit about uh, how to do deep learning. Uh, it's it's gonna be a bit focused on how you do deep learning at NERSC, uh, obviously, but um, uh, mm -hmm. concepts are, are, I think, transferable to wherever you might be doing deep learning. Uh, I'm gonna give a presentation. I'm starting to share my screen now. The presentation will be a bit uh, high level covering some of our offerings for running deep learning workloads at NERSC. Um, some of the, the concepts of, you know, how you can use our software, um, how you can access things on Jupyter, um, and then how you start to take that to the next level and scale up your workload to run, uh, let's say, model training in a parallel way across multiple GPUs and nodes on Perlmutter. Uh, it's probably gonna be about 20 minutes. And then after that, Shashank, my colleague, is going to walk you through some example code that we have. We have a Jupyter Notebook there with a fairly simple problem to train a model. Um, there's a repository you'll have access to. Uh, you'll be able to run things on NERSC. We don't have anything specific set up in terms of reservations or training accounts, uh, but uh, during the session, you could, um, um, get started and run things live uh, and submit jobs uh, with whatever allocations you have. And uh, hopefully then we'll also have enough time for discussion and questions. So Lippy shared and some other folks, I think in the chat shared a uh, link to the, the Q&A doc. Uh, feel free to drop stuff in there. While I'm talking, I'm not gonna be able to see the uh, the questions here, but uh, my colleagues will be watching that and, and maybe be able to answer some questions. And at the end of the talk, maybe we can do some live. I, I guess we're just going to kind of play it by ear a little bit here. And let me go slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first, who am I? Um, I'm Steve Farrell. I'm a machine learning engineer at NERSC in the Data, AI, and Analytic Services group. So Shashank is a fellow ML engineer, um, as well as uh, Peter Harrington might be on the call too, or if not, maybe he'll join later. Um, but broadly, we support the machine learning workloads at NERSC. We make sure our systems are functional and performant for machine learning. If you ever submit a ticket where you say PyTorch doesn't work, uh, it probably comes to one of us um, and, and we do our best to help you. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about the kinds of things that we do. But um, so the, the, the whole reason we're here, of course, is uh, because we're in the middle of this AI revolution, kind of transforming more and more aspects of our daily lives as time goes on. And at the core of that, this is all being powered by a technology called deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning, which is uh, based on 
a kind of model called a deep neural network, um, which is fairly computationally expensive. These tend to have a lot of parameters and um, um, are, are able to learn complex uh, relations and representations from data to solve to solve problems. And you, 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 you train them from data directly. Um, deep learning tends to do best compared to traditional machine learning or other techniques when you have lots of data. Uh, in science, we often have lots of data. Um, and the whole kind of takeover of deep learning really goes back to around 2013 uh, when folks started using GPUs to train these models, which are very good for training things like convolutional neural networks and, and started winning competitions. So on the lower right is um, uh, when GPUs started started to be used, you know, in 2013, you can see there, there this is when convolutional nets started winning this ImageNet competition. And from there, everything is just kind of really taken off and gone, gone crazy. So um, nowadays we all know about things like uh, ChatGPT and large language models, but really AI is behind a lot of the things we use on a daily basis. Uh, anytime we you know, use voice recognition on our phone, uh, Google search, um, uh, recommendations, the, the kind of ads that we get, uh, AI is behind a lot of this stuff. <clears throat> and, and AI is very much transforming science too. And we see that across all science domains. I don't think I've found a science domain yet where they can't use AI or they're not already really looking closely at what they can do with it. Um, of course, I, th I think it's it's having a bigger impact in those domains where they um, really have big data. Uh, I am hearing some noise. So uh, just a reminder that if you're if you're joining, um, please make sure you, you mute yourself. Um, and across all domains also, uh, folks are finding that they can use AI in um, uh, many, many different application areas. Um, uh, there's almost no limit to the the, the ways that, that you can use AI uh, for certain science problems. People are using it to uh, to help analyze their data, to get better results from their data than they might have with, let's say, heuristic techniques or um, even traditional machine learning techniques. Uh, they're finding that, that AI can help uh, get their solutions faster, uh, particularly if you had previously relied on, let's say, manual human labeling of data, like identifying galaxies in you know, astronomical images or something like this. Uh, now you can automate that or do things faster with, um, with these deep neural network models. <clears throat> uh, something that's um, really resonating a lot in the HPC communities uh, is, is using AI to accelerate expensive simulations because the bulk of the computational workloads on our supercomputers are you know, simulating physical systems like materials with atoms. And uh, people are using AI to do things like uh, replace some expensive computation in a simulation, like re replace density functional theory to compute forces on atoms, or even using AI methods to completely replace a simulation, like some of uh, my colleagues like Shashank are doing to try and replace weather forecasting simulations with fully uh, AI solutions. And um, it's not just in the science communities, but the funding agencies also are really embracing AI. There have been a number of calls in the last uh, in the last few years, and we anticipate more more to come. Um, we 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 uh, we find out what people in the science communities are doing in a number of ways. So we have ways of tracking things that are running on on Perlmutter, um, but we also send out. Um, was there a question or just a sound? Okay. Um, and and this is I have some plots in this presentation from uh, a previous version of the survey from 2022. A little bit later, I'll have a link to the ongoing survey, and I'll ask you to fill that out, especially if you're doing machine learning today. Um, but uh, from the survey that we did in 2022, we know that you know our scientific AI users are coming from all kinds of science domains. Uh, there's also down here in the lower left a wide range in in both expertise and also in the maturity of the, the workflows that they're developing. So here, this plot down here starts from, uh, you know, how many people are just at a brainstorming phase versus at the bottom, having fully developed uh, AI workflows and scientific production. <clears throat> people are doing things like using it for offline data analysis. Uh, a fair number of respondents say they're using it with, like to augment or replace simulations. And uh, down on the lower right, people are doing things like regressions, so predicting some kind of numerical quantity, uh, which is not too surprising, I think, in science, but also all other kinds of things like using AI for classification and generative modeling. 
Um, and there's a growing need for high performance computing resources to, to solve these problems. That's because of the growing computational cost of training these AI models, particularly as we are tackling harder problems using bigger data sets and using bigger models. So the, the plot here on the top uh, shows uh, two eras, let's say the traditional machine learning era, um, the, the cost, the, com the compute cost to train popular models. Uh, on the left, this is the before deep learning era. This is an exponential growth because it's a log plot here. Uh, and then the right end of that plot shows a sharp increase, which is the deep learning era where now um, things are growing much more rapidly. And then on the bottom, we, we see there's actually yet another era of growth in compute costs from the, uh, the explosion of large language models. So to, to use these for science, researchers really need large scale compute resources so that they can rapidly iterate, so they can reduce time to discovery. <clears throat> Uh, but the 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 life cycle, the AI for science life cycle is fairly complex and iterative. So I think um, what most people do as they're getting started, they're going to start in something of some kind of experimentation phase. Uh, and we know that a lot of NERSC users really like to use Jupyter. It's a very popular service. And um, from uh, from our last survey, we know that maybe something like half of, of, of all these people like to use Jupyter notebooks really in this experimentation phase to develop their machine learning models. Um, but at some point, you know, you're, you're probably going to get to the point where you need to start uh, doing things maybe in a more rigorous way, or maybe you need to scale up. Um, you might have started with a small mini data set. You're, you're starting to play with, with models and try to figure out what might work for your problem. Uh, but, but then maybe you have a rough idea, but now you're going to need to do full scale training of your models. Uh, you might need to use parallelism. You will maybe want to switch to submitting batch jobs to Perlmutter in that case. We're going to show you how to do that. Uh, you will probably want to do things like hyperparameter tuning, maybe more expensive uh, validation and verification. And hopefully, you know, assuming all that works well, you can actually put things into some sort of deployment phase where you can really use it for your scientific workload and, and solve some cool problems. And, you know, at, at some point you're going to go back maybe to the board and, and do experimentation again or back to full scale training. Um, the, the, this is not really meant to be the definitive um, uh, picture of what the AI for science life cycle looks like, but the important thing is that it's definitely an iterative procedure where you're going to be kind of going back and forth between experimenting at a small scale and, and potentially running things at a larger scale. Um, this diagram on the lower right was something I found online, which is somebody's view of what the ML ops uh, life cycle looks like. And you can see, uh, it, it, depending on how you look at it, it can be fairly complex. So uh, our strategy at NERSC to support this you know, new um, cool emerging workload is, is you can kind of think of it as three pronged. So um, of course, we're trying to deploy systems that work well for AI, not just the hardware, but also the software on top of that. And not just for AI, because we have a very diverse user base and workload at NERSC. We have like 10,000 users. Um, um, they're not all doing AI, uh, still the bulk of the workloads are traditional HPC simulations. So our, our systems kind of have to cater to uh, all kinds of computational workloads. Um, so we try to deploy good systems, but also we, we engage with scientists and we, we help push on the frontier of the methods. Uh, we, 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 we help with research and, and do cool things like that. Um, uh, for example, with our NESAT program, which is where we uh, partner some postdocs or um, liaisons at NERSC to work with science teams that are doing cool problems that are uh, strategically relevant to, to everybody. Um, and then finally, we do a lot to empower the community more broadly through events like this, training events, um, also tutorials we do at conferences, seminars and workshops, lots of things like that. <clears throat> Uh, so in terms of the deployment category, uh, we have one system today, which happens to be really great for um, machine learning and deep learning, which is Perlmutter. Uh, you're probably already familiar with it, but um, just a quick review, Perlmutter uh, came out as number five on the top 500 list. Uh, today it's, it's number 12, um, uh, but it has a lot of um, NVIDIA A100 or Ampere GPUs, about 7,000 of them actually, around 1,800 nodes. So each one has four of these A100 GPUs. And then we also have a fairly sizable CPU only partition, about 3,000 nodes. Perlmutter has the HPE slingshot um, uh, network. 
And then in terms of storage, we have a 35 petabyte all flash luster system, which serves as a scratch space, and then uh, a range of off platform storage options that all kind of have their different, their different use cases. So you may be familiar with the home file system, the community file system, and our tape archive. <clears throat> Uh, okay, but as I said, it's not just the hardware, um, the software is also essential. So I'll say a little bit about what we offer in terms of software and, and what we recommend our users to, to do and use. So our general strategy here is that we, we do try to build and provide installations that are uh, meant to be um, um, optimally tuned for our systems and cover what are the most popular frameworks and libraries that, that we think our users need. Uh, so again, things like the survey help inform us on that, on, on what people are using. Um, and then beyond that, we really strive to enable the kind of flexibility that, that our users really need. <laughs> uh, hey, just a reminder, if you're on the call, uh, to please to please mute yourselves. <clears throat> or if you have a question, um, you, know, you, you can put it in the, the Q&A doc. Uh, yeah, so uh, we, we provide functional performance installations, but also try to enable folks to, to bring their own condo environments or do, do what they want as well. Um, so the most popular things today, most I think most of our users are using PyTorch for deep learning, um, but there is you know, a whole suite of libraries. We, we, also, we, we provide and we build and provide uh, PyTorch installations and TensorFlow installations, and we have documentation that covers a lot of the other things. And uh, the other things on this slide, I'll, I'll come back to in a little bit. So to use our deep learning stack on Perlmutter, uh, so we have modules, which are actually, um, these are the the, uh, the installations that we build and provide, and they're actually complete Python environments. So you can do, for example, module load PyTorch, you can do module load PyTorch slash some specific version, like this one here is the latest, 2.1.0-Q12 uh, for Q to 12. Um, and um, this won't activate a condo environment, but it does set up your environment that corresponds to a whole uh, installation of Python uh, with PyTorch and all the other relevant packages, as well as environment variables that are uh, tuned for running correctly on, on Perlmutter. So you can also do module load TensorFlow. Uh, you can check to see what versions of things we have available as modules. You can do module avail, or you can type module spider. PyTorch, um, you can just play with these to kind of see what, what the difference is, but Spider tends to be a little bit, it has more features for exploration. Uh, there are different ways you can customize on top of these. So um, if there's a package that we think a lot of users will need, we will just install it into these module environments. Um, but of course, we're not gonna uh, have everything that, that you might need for your specific application. Uh, you can install packages on top of a module environment by using a pip install dash dash user command here. Um, you have to use that a little bit sparingly. There are ways you can get into trouble um, uh, using this too much. So I would just only use it maybe if you just have a couple of packages that you want to add on top of on top of that. And if you have any issues, then you can always come to us for help. Uh, you can also clone our module environments as Conda environments, and then you can install whatever you want on top of that. Um, the only trick to that is you have to get the path to the um, to the installation. Um, I, I don't show how to do that on here, um, but you could do module show PyTorch and find the path and then use this conda create command with the clone here to, um, to, to clone that environment and then you can install whatever you want on top of that. Um, again, just ask us if, if you need any help with that. Um, and then uh, if enough people do that, then we'll probably do a little more, uh, a better job in our documentation if it sounds like something people, everybody really like. Uh, of course, you can also just create your own custom Conda environments uh, from scratch as well. So uh, refer to our documentation here. We have a PyTorch page and a TensorFlow page, and there's a bit more on the docs too, uh, depending on what you want to do. And if there's something there that, that, that doesn't answer your question, feel free to open a ticket or, you know, today use our Q&A doc. Um, so that's kind of modules and Conda environments, uh, but you can also run containers on Perlmutter. In fact, we have a couple of ways to do containers on Perlmutter these days. Uh, containers are actually really great for uh, deploying machine learning workloads, training, or whatever on Perlmutter. Um, I can talk a little bit more about why, um, but the 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 kind of the the standard way that we've been recommending people deploy uh, machine learning things on Perlmutter is with our um, in-house container rate runtime called Shifter. Um, it's pretty easy to use. It's also really performant. In fact, our, our best like benchmark results, like submissions to top 500 
or um, MLPerf machine learning benchmark results that I work on a bit. Uh, we use containers for all of those. Uh, we do build some containers that roughly correspond to the module environments that we have here, uh, but but built on NVIDIA based containers, which tend to have the the most the latest and greatest uh, software stack for machine learning on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, you can see what images are currently available. You can run Shifter M IMG images. Uh, you can grep for things like PyTorch and see, for example, our, our nurse PyTorch images. Um, you can pull any image from Docker Hub or your own um, image that you've built. If you want to use things interactively, you can do something like this, run the shifter command here, or if you're going to run things in a batch job, uh, you can use the, the options like I show here. So um, there are these S batch directives uh, and uh, special slurm arguments that we have for um, uh, for shifter on Perlmutter via some some plugin functionality that we have. So you can specify the image you want to use here, like this, like a Nurse PyTorch image. Uh, NGC means it's the um, it's 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 built on the NVIDIA's NGC base container. And then 2307 is the tag from NVIDIA, so that's the July 2023 version of their container. Uh, and, and then there's this module argument here, uh, which controls things that we bring in from the system, certain libraries that, that are necessary to use the system well. Like for GPU, this would pull in the, the CUDA driver that's necessary. Or, and, and this nickel module here will pull in um, a nickel stack and plug in, which knows how to uh, leverage our slingshot network efficiently. <clears throat> Um, okay, so Jupiter, uh, Jupiter is in the title of this event. Um, we don't have a whole lot really super specific to Jupiter, but Shashank is later going to show you how you use our Jupiter service to, to get started, how you can choose a kernel, um, and, and start training a model there. Um, but it's a really popular service at NERSC. Uh, we have, I think, thousands of users. And as I said, it's a favorite way for our users to, to start developing their machine learning code. Um, we provide kernels. Here again, these these correspond actually to those modules like PyTorch and TensorFlow modules that we have. So you can just easily click and get started with one of those environments. Um, but you can also do your own custom kernels based on your kind of environments. You can even do containers and the documentation has a bit of information on how you do that. Okay, I'm already at the 20 minute mark. So I'm going a little bit longer than I was expecting. I'll probably go a little bit faster and um, um, and again, just feel free to, if you, if you get confused about anything or need any additional information, just to put questions in the Q&A. Um, so let, let's say you want to take it to the next level. You want to start doing distributed deep learning. Uh, that's what this next section is about. And a lot of this material comes from a tutorial that we do um, at conferences like Supercomputing, specifically here from the, the last version of that, which was at SC23. The tutorial is called Deep Learning at Scale. If you're interested in learning a lot more about this topic, uh, performance optimization and parallelism for, for training deep learning models, I uh, encourage you very much to, to, to come to our next, next version of that. So um, the general strategy though, if you're, if you're gonna try and do this, maybe you're, you're training a model and it's, it's just not fast enough. Um, so here I'm gonna talk about how, how you go about optimizing that and, and making things faster. So let's say you're starting with an appropriate model. It trains on you know, a single GPU. Um, what we do in the tutorial a lot is talk a little bit about how it's important to, to first optimize the performance uh, without going distributed yet. It's easy to just say, well, my, my model training is slow, so I'm going to throw hundreds of GPUs at it. Um, but a lot of times you can uh, get a lot more out of your compute hours by really taking a little bit of time and optimizing the performance, even at the level of a single GPU. So you can use performance anal analysis tools. You can use profilers like, um, uh, like NVIDIA's uh, Insight Systems. Um, and or, or even just look at NVIDIA SMI to make sure you're, you're using a GPU well. You want to look at the, the utilization and make sure it's not um, really low. If it is, uh, you might want to look at things like your data loading pipeline. Maybe that is um, maybe that needs some work. Maybe you need to increase the number of parallel workers or things like that. Um, once you feel kind of comfortable with, with the amount of effort you put into optimizing the single GPU performance, then you can look at distributing the training across multiple processors. So you can use multiple GPUs on a node, or if you need even more than that, you can go to multi-node training. Uh, most people are going to do just data parallelism, but you can, if you really need to, uh, look at model parallelism. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, yeah, that's probably enough on that slide. So um, there are uh, various ways to parallelize the training of neural network models. Uh, the most popular and the simplest is data parallelism. Uh, this is where you actually replicate your model across devices, um, but 
partition or chunk up the, the, um, the input data. So for each mini batch of training, you're going to shard that and have like little um, um, mini, mini batches on each device. <clears throat> And um, that, that is what you should use if you can get away with it. But if your models are so large that they don't even fit on a single GPU, then you might have to use model parallelism, where now you're actually breaking up the model. It's either in terms of its parameters, its layers, um, or, the compu or its actual computation on input samples. And now you're distributing that across, uh, across either GPUs or, or nodes. Uh, we're not going to talk so much about that today. If you want to learn more, then, then um, definitely check out our tutorial. But again, data parallelism is the easiest thing to get started with. Uh, and then I just have one quick slide on how that works. Um, so when you do data parallelism, you're, um, you're taking a mini batch of data and you're sharding that across GPUs. If you have a local batch on each GPU of B, then uh, your global batch size, which is actually the relevant one for training, is going to be N times B if you have N GPUs. And um, what you typically do then is, is it's a little bit like an MPI job, but um, you're going to start up, you're going to do some sort of broadcast to synchronize all the, the, the models across all the, the devices. Uh, and then during training at each step, what's going to happen is the, the gradients, each, each GPU is going to have its own local um, estimate of the gradients, and, and you're going to do an average uh, across all the GPUs via an all reduced call. Okay, libraries will mostly just take care of this, this for you. Uh, but there are some things that you have to kind of think about and be aware of. Um, as you're scaling up and using more and more GPUs, remember your global batch size may, you know, is, is, is sort of N times B, right? So if you have a local batch size of 32 and you know you have a thousand GPUs, then really your batch size is 32,000. And so that has implications for how you train the models. Um, you have to, uh, in short, you have to tune your hyperparameters. As you go to larger batch sizes, generally, you're going to try to use larger learning rates so that you're taking larger optimization steps and hopefully uh, getting to convergence faster. Um, again, just just ask us if you um, if anything's not clear, if you have any more, uh, if you need any more details on how this works. Uh, so we provide libraries and we have some recommendations for what worked best on Perlmutter. Um, uh, in our PyTorch installations, they, they come with pretty good just distributed data parallel wrappers for doing distributed training. Shashank will show you that a little bit later. TensorFlow has built-in stuff, um, but our users also like uh, a lot of different libraries that are available, such as PyTorch Lightning. Um, Deep Speed from Microsoft is one that uh, has quite a bit of, of features for parallelism. Uh, as well as memory optimizations, these so-called zero or um, um, zero redundancy optimizer uh, type things. Uh, I'll just uh, save the details on, on, unless you uh, unless you ask for them. Uh, and then a whole, a whole other range of things. So um, whatever you want to use should in principle work on Perlmutter. Um, we can't document everything, uh, but we do have a growing number of examples. And again, if you need help, you can always open a ticket. Uh, and then in terms of communication, so um, the most the, the the best library to use for communication and distributed training on our system is Nickel. That's NVIDIA's com collective communications library. Uh, and we have a special plugin that we've developed with HPE and NVIDIA uh, based on something that AWS first made that that um, that makes Nickel work with our Perlmutter Slingshot network. So this is uh, covered in our docs and happy to answer more questions on how it works. Um, I think I'll just... Uh, mostly skip this, but um, at some point as you scale up, you might find that really uh, it's really essential to use additional high level tools for your research. So tools that can help you do hyperparameter optimization, which can be a bit complex and computationally expensive, as well as tools that help you with experiment tracking and visualization so that your research is really reproducible and more interpretable. And people use a variety of things, um, which again, we, we, we try to make sure that they work. We can't test everything, um, but if you have any issues, we're happy to help you. Uh, we do have some examples of things that, that you might find useful. We have a documentation page on hyperparameter tools. Uh, we have a template that Shashank put together to get started with weights and biases uh, that can show you how to do tracking as well as hyperparameter tuning and, and some other cool things. Uh, we have a special launcher for TensorBoard that, that you can um, um, use in Jupyter and things like that. Okay, then just very briefly, here's a slide that gives you kind of an overview of all the other sorts of outreach things that we do. I don't think this even covers everything, um, but we have a lot of great content from this Deep Learning for Science school that we did for a couple of years in a row. Uh, good introductory stuff as well as advanced things, videos, slides, code, they're all online. There's the Deep Learning at Scale tutorial that I mentioned. We've been working with folks at NVIDIA and HPE and Oak Ridge on that. 
And we usually do that at supercomputing, but we've done it at just a whole bunch of events. Uh, you can see all the content from the last version of that down here from SC23. Um, a lot of nurse training events will have some machine learning part to them. Uh, NVIDIA help put on, is going to help put on an LLM boot camp coming up. In fact, you can apply for that right now. Uh, there was an AI for Science boot camp last year. Uh, we've had presentations at day to day and new user training, but the content overlaps a bit with what I'm showing today. And then, of course, uh, we do regular data seminar uh, series. Um, so that's it. I think I'll just end here. Um, if uh, if you want, you can also join our NERSC user Slack uh, to kind of get more connected in the, the rest of the machine learning community that uses NERSC. And um, if you would, uh, I would really appreciate it if you could take our machine learning at NERSC survey, which is now open. This is really um, important to inform us about the requirements of the community, what people are using, what they're struggling with, um, what kind of faith or any feedback that they have or things that they think we should do differently. So please, it shouldn't take too long. If you could fill that out, we would really, really appreciate it. And uh, with that, then I am finished. And I'm going to turn it over to Shashank to get more into the um, the walkthrough of the 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 hands or not really hands on, but you know the 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 interactive stuff, the the code that we're providing. And, and there's a, a link here. I guess you don't have the um, the slides yet, but we can put it in the chat. Um, if there are any questions now, maybe maybe we could we could take them. But I haven't yet looked at the the document. Um, yeah, Shashank, are, anybody, are there any questions that you think I should answer here, or should we just move on? It's up to you. Yeah, we've been getting some good answers from um, Peter and other folks. So um, why don't we go ahead and move through the interactive portion and people can keep asking. What we normally do is we keep this Q&A document open so people can use it even after the session has ended. And usually someone will come back to it and make sure that all the questions have been answered. So it's not like once the session ends, this Q&A document is gonna disappear, we'll still be able to answer questions. So let's go through the interactive portion and we'll come back to the Q&A. Great, so Shashank, are you there? Yeah, okay, sounds good. Uh, let me take over the screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, uh, thanks, Steve. So in this part, I'm just going to do a quick run through of the material that we have. Um, the GitHub link should be in the Q&A job um, at the top here. Uh, and it should direct you to this repository. It's a public repo, so it's always going to be there and you can always come back to this whenever you want. And the idea is that it kind of includes uh, some minimal example scripts that show you how to get started with uh, your deep learning workflow on a Jupyter notebook. And then uh, usually notebooks are pretty nice for testing or small scale runs uh, because they kind of uh, enable interactivity with the code base, uh, especially if you want to uh, plot how things are looking and uh, understand better how things work under the hood. And then once you move from that more researchy phase into a more production type space, uh, it's going to show you how to move the scripts uh, that can run on multiple GPUs uh, with data parallelism. Um, so I'll be going over this readme. It is fairly self-contained, so you can certainly do it on your own, or you can follow along as I go through it. Uh, I'll first kind of open up a simple Jupyter notebook um, and go over some quick recommendations of what you can do um, and run it and then show you how to move that notebook to a script. Um, all the scripts, notebooks are already in this repository. Um, again, provide some general guidelines for running scripts and uh, we will train the simple script on a single GPU. Um, and then we will transform that script to a script that can run multiple GPUs. And we're going to use PyTorch distributed data panel for this. And there is really not a big distinction between running it on multiple, multiple GPUs or multiple nodes. Uh, it's all the same script. And we'll go with that. And then finally, there's like a bunch of other best practices that we recommend 
And if you find this tutorial very easy for you, there's like more tutorials that kind of make it progressively more advanced, all the way to building production workloads in model thousands that will run like thousands of GPUs. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so finding Jupyter Notebooks is fairly simple. You would visit Jupyter Hub. Uh, I kind of already opened it because uh, sometimes it takes a while to start a, a Jupyter Notebook. Um, and once you're in there, you will just ask for your resource. So you can search Jupyter Notes. You'll kind of come, come to this homepage and you can start either like a shared GPU node, which I've already started. Uh, and you, you can also have like configurable jobs if you want to run on like more resources. So now once you're there, um, you can kind of navigate to where you've cloned the repository on your machine. And, and, that'll, and there you can find like the train underscore single GPU.ibymb, which is a Jupyter notebook. Um, and in, in general, as Steve mentioned, it's fairly straightforward to start in the notebook. You would just click on the plus sign. And there's a bunch of kernels that's already available to you. Uh, we recommend starting off here. For example, I'm going to choose the PyTorch kernel. And uh, excuse me, sorry. Yeah, and it's going to um, start a notebook with this kernel. So that I only have access to all the PyTorch libraries. So if I just import Torch, it should work. And the idea is that this kernel also has other libraries that users generally use, like I don't want to do NumPy, um, oops, or uh, you know, Matplotlib. Uh, it should just automatically work. So, um, the general recommendation here is if you're not doing things too complicated, you could just install any custom libraries on top of this uh, PyTorch module using pip install minus user. So, if I do something like pip install uh, minus minus user and my light name, it will install that library into the Python user base. So if you want to look at that environment variable, uh, modules automatically set that to some location. So for me, it's in my dot local uh, directly under PyTorch 2.01. And the idea is that any custom libraries that you need that's not there in this kernel, if you just install it with the minus minus user plan. If you're doing more complicated things, you can certainly use your own calendar environment. Uh, so we kind of link the nurse docs, which tell you exactly how to do that. Or you can also review some other slides that I've linked here, which also take you step by step on how do you use your own calendar environment. So for example, if I just go here, it shows you exactly how to start a Jupyter notebook. And um, you will essentially follow like these steps to create your own uh, Jupyter kernel with your own content environment. Okay, so you can certainly do that. Uh, and for this notebook, I'm just going to use the PyTorch kernel, but you can switch it up to your own kernel if you want. Okay, so I'm just going to clear everything um, so we can run it live. So this is meant to be a very minimal notebook that shows you the most common workflow that you deal with when you're kind of building your own deep learning workflow. So you start with some basic inputs, and in PyTorch, you would use Torch.nn to define your model. Uh, I'm defining a really simple model here, which is a CNN. But as your models get more and more complex, um, I would generally recommend you to just move to a separate file and import it here. Okay, so we have a dummy model. And the PyTorch uh, docs are actually very comprehensive in how to define data loaders. And in fact, most of the things. So, for example, if I just visit this link, it will show me exactly how do, you, how do I deal with the data set and how do I expose that to my plain workflow. So uh, you can either use existing data sets like fashion and this. Uh, most of the time you're building a custom data set, so you do have to define like your custom data set class, uh, which essentially defines three functions. And that's exactly what we've done here. Oops. Um, well, this is like some custom test data sets and it's defined the init, the length and get item. Uh, idea is that the initialization uh, kind of defines the location of the data set. It's not used here, but you would point it to some part in your splash directly. For example, uh, the length tells you how many samples are there in your data set. That's what you have to return. And get item defines the logic to get a single sample from your data set. So it tells me how do I get index 
uh, IDX from my data set. So here I'm just using random tensors, so make it very easy, but in principle, you could have like an HDFI file, file uh, which you would read here and open it and then uh, query a single index from the HDFI file and return. So the get item returns the inputs that was target for training. Uh, you would pass this data set to your data loader. Once again, all of this are PyTorch utilities. Uh, pass the batch size because you're running mini batch gradient descent for training. Um, we recommend that you play around with this number of curve parameters. It kind of tells you how to use multiple processes to get the data uh, that usually speeds up your workflow. Um, and uh, yeah, other things are just uh, shuffling and shuffling the data. And um, uh, this, the last thing is just an optimization uh, of that that you can pass. Okay, so we have like an example data loader. Uh, you can do this in many ways. Uh, we usually like to use YAML files to define our configuration. So what this does is it defines different hyperparameters that your workflow is using. This could be hyperparameters relating to the data set, hyperparameters relating to the model, the optimization or other things that's uh, specific to your workflow. So for example, here, uh, like a default YAML config, and uh, it's just called default. Uh, it defines, you know, number of data workers I want to use in my data loader, some model height parameters, optimization, like learning rate, batch sizes, and some other stuff. And the idea is that you can make things clean by deriving your own configuration from this base config and changing the hyperparameters. So we have like a quick utility which reads a YAML file and these are the hyperparameters that this script is going to be using. Okay, so very important, you want to make sure that you're running on the right device. So uh, on a GPU node, it checks if CUDA is available and then sets my device to GPU number zero. Uh, this is all single GPU stuff. Okay, uh, you, de you define some batch sizes. Uh, all of this comes from my config. Uh, which is default of YAML. And I'm going to also define my training and validation data loader. Uh, define my model, uh, my optimizer, which is using Atom and a learning rate schedule and loss function. Uh, and that's it. So you can now start your training loop. So we have like a training where you do a forward pass, compute the loss, uh, backward pass, compute gradients, uh, and then optimizer to update your model weights using the gradients. Um, uh, what's important is that you want to make sure that all of your uh, models as well as your data is always passed to the GPU. Um, you want to do this within the training loop and not in the data loader because data loader gives you samples one by one and typically you're sending like a batch size amount of samples to the GPU. Okay, and then you have a validation loop um, and that's it. So the Jupyter notebook is very simple. You should run this and then it will just run. Um, like, I think this was like 25 epochs and there's like some statements. So usually your Jupyter notebook workflow is pretty simple like this. And on top of this, you would write your own custom functions to plot images or the metrics and play around with your model. Um, but at some point, you're gonna to want to scale up and move to a, a more production type workload because your data set is getting bigger or your model is getting bigger or it's just taking hours and hours to run your Jupyter notebook. Um, okay, so at that point, uh, we recommend that you move from a notebook to a script. Um, this is effectively so if you want to run on multiple GPUs because it is a little bit tricky to get this working with Jupyter notebooks. So, so now in this section, uh, we definitely recommend organizing parts of your codes like uh, uh, models and data loaders into separate subdirectory. Uh, this is, you, don't, you don't have to do this, but it really makes it easier to add features and uh, it's especially useful if you're collaborating with multiple people. And this is how it's generally done in the machine learning community. So for example, here, I put the models into the model subdirectory, that's the CNN that we defined. Same thing, same exact same code. Uh, my utils has the data loader. Uh, Again, exact same code, and uh, my contexts are in the context directory. So you can look at the single GPU script uh, either in Jupyter itself, uh, or I'm just going to switch to my terminal. Uh, 
this is just like your personal preference. And uh, yeah, what you can see is it's it's basically the same code copy pasted, except uh, we kind of used a class, so we're given like one level of abstraction to the code. Uh, again, this is not strictly speaking necessary, but it does make it easier to add more custom functions. And usually, uh, like one or two levels of abstraction makes your code more modular and easier to expand. Okay, so same code, I'm setting the device uh, to the GPU if it's available, uh, looking at the balance config from the YAML file. Um, I write an extra function here that initializes an experiment directly. This is where I'm going to direct all the outputs from my training workflow. Um, typically, we put this on Scratch, uh, exactly where you put your data set. Again, we recommend that you use Scratch for this because the last of our system performance is better. Um, one additional thing here is that we're creating a folder for checkpoints. This refers to model checkpoints where we want to implement this feature called checkpoint restart. Uh, we highly recommend that you do this for your machine learning workflows, especially when you're scaling up. Uh, what checkpoint restart does is uh, every epoch or every iteration, whatever your algorithm is doing, it saves the model state along with the optimizer state and the learning rate scheduler and anything else it needs to the file system. And then you can always begin training from wherever you left off without any issues. So this is pretty important when you're submitting jobs to uh, the bad scheduler because there is a uh, typically some sort of time limit on your jobs. And let's say your job actually is going to run for five days because it's just such a big job, then you want to implement checkpoint restart so that you can pick up right away the left off. So for that, we added like two extra functions. Uh, once again, you can get all this from the PyTorch documentation, but it's all here in one place to make it easier for you, where you save your checkpoint using touch.save and you need to save which epoch you're at, all the model parameters, optimizer parameters, as well as the learning rate scheduler, if you have one. And the store checkpoint basically tells me that, okay, I want to start my model from some existing model checkpoint. So you will load from some checkpoint path and load it onto uh, GPU zero here because we're still doing single GPU training. Um, okay, everything else is Exactly, again, so you have a training loop uh, where you're doing some training and some validation, and you're basically good to go to run the script. So uh, to run the script, it's a single GPU, so you can definitely use an interactive node. We do not recommend that you run any training workloads on the login node, even though the login node has a single GPU. It's meant for like debugging purposes and very quick tests, uh, and login node is also shared. So to run the single uh, GPU training, you can request an interactive node using SL. And this is just your NERSC project account. Um, I already got, got a node because it was just easier, uh, but, but the general script is just you would uh, use SL to get a single node for 30 minutes using the GPU partition, and that's just the staff account. Um, so, you normally won't have the PyTorch library, so I'm going to use the module here. But again, once again, as Steve said, you could um, you could definitely use your own content environment or even like ship to containers, uh, whatever whatever your preference is. Okay, so once you load the module, uh, as I said before, this will already define this uh, this environment variable for you, which means that if I wanted libraries on top of this, I can just do pip install. So you can install minus minus user and whatever live name. Yeah, whatever it is that you want. And it will just install this directly and that, that is like a cleaner way to do it. So that it doesn't like interfere with other libraries that you already have. Uh, to run the script, uh, you just do Python train single GPU. Uh, there are some uh, Arguments that you can pass, but I'm just going to take the default arguments here. Um, okay, so this is on a single GPU. Um, you can certainly SSH into compute nodes um, while things are running to see how things are going. Uh, for example, if I do NVIDIA SMI, oh, oops, okay, it's already finished, but I could definitely do NVIDIA SMI and see that something is running on my GPU. Um, this is like a good way to track memory usage and uh, making sure that nothing's going off. 
Okay, so once you have the script environment, it is now straightforward to transform the script into a script that runs multiple GPUs. Uh, so for this, we're going to use uh, PyTorch distributed data parallel, um, which is the recommended way to do data parallelism in PyTorch, and especially so on for model. Uh, once again, the PyTorch docs are fairly comprehensive, and we're going to start off here. And a general guideline is that if there's something that's confusing, the PyTorch docs are a great starting point uh, for you to understand how to fix the issue. So the way this video data parallel works is that it works with multi-classes. So it will basically spawn multiple processes, each assigned to a single GPU. And the idea is that every GPU does its own computations in parallel uh, for a different data shard, as Steve was mentioning in the presentation. And uh, this video data parallel will automatically take care of all your communication and syncing between the uh, uh, the different parallel ones. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, change our script to include this video data parallel. Uh, it's fairly simple. There's only five steps. Uh, you would first initialize cross start distributed um, using uh, this init process group function. Uh, this is going to initialize the different processes uh, that's going to do the data parallelism for you. And the idea is that uh, this function will pick up two parameters, uh, world size and rank. World size refers to the total number of GPUs that you want to use to run your workflow. And rank is the world rank of your GPU. So if you're running on GPU number 57, then 57 is a rank for your GPU. So uh, this function is going to pick up these numbers from environment variables that you will need to set. And I'm going to come to how to define these environment variables in your submit script. But let's assume that it's set properly and you would just call touch dot distributed dot in process group. So um, we already created that script for you. It's called play underscore multi GPU. So exact same script, but we're gonna add a few more lines. Uh, so it's gonna query world size uh, from the environment variable world size. And uh, so this needs to be set. And as I said before, I'm gonna show you how to do that in the submit script. And I'm just gonna call um, touch dot distributed the end process group. And this is just uh, an alias for touch dot distributed. Okay, uh, next step would be to make sure you set your current device. So you start to create a set device to your local rank. Local rank is the rank of your GPU on a specific node. So on full model, you have four GPUs. So your local rank is so 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, the two DNN benchmark is actually some optimization benchmarks that might launch run automatically for you in the back end to make sure it's using the right kernel sizes uh, for the different for the kernels that actually get executed in the background. Okay, um, and the third step is to wrap your model with distributed data parallel. So let's start here. So as you define the model before, you would have to wrap it with GDP. Uh, everything else remains the same. And then you would just proceed with training exactly as you would with a single GPU. And GDP will automatically take, you, take care of syncing the gradients across when you call last log back. So the way it works is underneath the hood, there's a, a gradient book where you compute the gradient and it will automatically fire off this hook, which will do an all reduce of gradients across multiple GPUs to keep that open. Uh, last step is to clean up all your process groups. That's in the end. Uh, you don't technically need this barrier function, which is kind of waiting for all GPUs to reach this point in your code, but it's fine to keep it uh, and you will just clean up all the process at the end. So that's basically it. Uh, there's a few more things that you want to be careful uh, which we've implemented here. One thing is that, um, uh, yeah, when you're creating directories, you just want to do it on the first process so that every process is not going and competing for this. Um, something that uh, I didn't talk about in README, and actually I should modify it to include this is the data loader. Uh, you can definitely find this in the docs, but uh, when you're using, DDP, you need to also introduce this distributed sampler. Uh, this is the function that takes care of splitting up your data across uh, multiple GPUs. Uh, it just queries the indices and then sends like a subset of indices to every single GPU so that every GPU is working on uh, a subset of the data set. Uh, so the way it works is you just import a distributed sampler and you pass the sampler to your data loader. 
now, and you just said shuffle samples. So you can find this in the docs. Um, I just open it up here. So is this view sampler? Um, it tells you exactly how to use it. You need to call it, uh, set the sampler equal sampler, and to actually shuffle your data before every epoch. In your training loop, you do have to set the epoch, saying sampler dot set epoch. So this is pretty important for ensuring the stochasticity and the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So we'll do that for you. So if you're in the training loop, you have to add this extra statement where you take a sampler and then you set the epoch to the current epoch number. Um, second thing to uh, keep track of is when you're saving your model checkpoint, you need to save it only using the first rank. So once again, I'm checking if my world rank is zero, and then I'm going to save my model checkpoint because you know, just recall that in DDP, all models have a copy, oh, sorry, all GPUs have a copy of the model. So it doesn't matter which GPU is saving the model. And we're just going to use the uh, first GPU to save the model. But when you are restoring the checkpoint, um, you want to make sure that the model is loaded onto the correct GPUs. Um, uh, hey, Shashank, just a time check. We're almost at the end of the hour. So I don't know if there's any other things you wanted to quickly show before we uh, run out of time. Oh, right. Okay, yeah, so you know, feel free to go over, but that was mostly what I wanted to say about the script. And we kind of included like the submit scripts, uh, which is how you actually submit this to the batch scheduler. Uh, you would use uh, a batch script and you can suddenly check this in the nurse docs where it tells you how to create a simple job script. Uh, here I'm gonna ask for two nodes, uh, four GPUs per node. Um, and these are specific to the train script that I have, uh, it's like the config file, config name, etc. Uh, once again, I'm going to use the module, the PyTorch module for my libraries, but you can definitely use the content environment. Um, yeah, and most important thing is setting the right environment with. So TDP expects to have a master address environment variable, which is like um, the IP address of the node that's responsible for spawning all the multiple processes. So the way SPATCH works is it's going to run on two nodes and it's going to uh, execute all these commands on a head compute node. And that one's going to set the master address. And we're going to use SRON to actually allocate those resources to this uh, Python script. And within that, we're going to source export TDP words. So let's see what that does. And yeah, so this is going to use uh, slow environment variables to set the world size and the rank. So, you know, in this previous script using S1, we're going to get eight GPUs in total. So it's going to set the world size to the total number of stats, which is eight, and the rank to the perf ID. Uh, master port is also like an open port that DDP needs uh, to initialize. And uh, yeah, once we have these environment variables, we're done. So to submit this script, you would just say as that submit. And uh, oops, I guess the Okay, that's just bad. And uh, hopefully at some point it runs, uh, but I do have some example uh, job logs already in the GitHub. So you can see that this job kind of run eight GPUs. Uh, we have this print statement where each GPU is printing its uh, world rank and total number of GPUs in the process in the in the workflow. Okay. Um, there's also a similar job script if you want to use Shifter. Uh, it's pretty simple, except you're going to use containers. Yeah, uh, please do check it out if you're interested in switching to containers. And the um, yeah, last thing I'll say is that there's a bunch of other best practices that we kind of included, which could be useful for you. Um, and there are other tutorials which kind of progressively take this up to uh, including uh, logging and hyperparameter optimization to this script. So there's a tutorial that shows you how to use weights and biases um, to essentially log different metrics from your training workflow and also do automatic hyperparameter optimization. It's the exact same script, except we're now included weights and biases. And weights and biases is a very cool tool. Uh, for example, this is how I want the dashboard looks like. One of those research projects that we have, where you kind of run different configurations and can check like, the different metrics that's logged. Uh, it also shows you how good performance you're getting on the system side. 
For example, resplitting workloads use 90% of the GPU uh, memory, and it also has pretty good utilization of the GPU. Okay, there's like a bunch of things that Blazing Biases will do, and you can uh, check out this tutorial to get more information. And if you're really interested in going to the more advanced portion, uh, we have an in-depth tutorial that we do every year on SC, uh, which takes you step by step in actually developing a state of the art AI for science model on a real application, starting from optimizing on a single GPU to doing data parallelism and model parallelism, and actually running it on a model. So, yeah, so if you're really interested in the advanced sections, uh, yeah, please do check out these tutorials. And um, otherwise, hopefully, this was useful. And we can probably open it up for questions um, or comments. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was really great. Um, yeah, we are done with our hour. I just want to put in one last plug for um, our web page that has all of our information. Um, the slides are now posted. The web, the recording will be made available. Please join us on Thursday, April 18th to learn more about how to submit tickets, um, how to submit good tickets. <laughs> um, and then we'll also be having a session on how to use VS Code on Perlmutter because that's a very... Uh, uh, sought after uh, uh, service that, that people are interested in. Um, thank you so much to our speakers. They will uh, hopefully be looking at the Q&A document. And um, again, if you have questions afterwards, you are welcome to submit a ticket and we'll route that to whoever needs to get it so that um, we can get you on your way with whatever machine learning you're doing. So thank you so much and see you next time. <laughs>